principles. Some of this will be the same as we've already talked about. I'm a little bit of overlap, so I might breeze through a few things that we've already talked about, but I want to make sure we um, go over some of these things. If um, we run out of time, then I will just cover it on Thursday as we go over the other antibiotics. So Thursday, just real quick while I have it in my mind, um, we're going to cover specific classes of drugs, and there's a lot of classes. You're going to need to know a prototype for each class, the mechanism of action, and some kind of adverse reaction or teaching. So as I go through slides on Thursday, I'll point out what those most important things are. What you should do to prepare for your exam is to make a drug chart for yourself where you're putting in those key things. So this is a good memorizing um, section for this class. Not everything in this class is memorizing, but here we are at a bunch of memorizing. So you have a bunch of different classes. On Canvas, um, under each class of drugs that you need, to look at, there's a PowerPoint and audio going over them. Um, I won't say the audio is the greatest. Obviously, it's not produced by anybody. It's me in my office with the door shut. So then it sounds like it's me in my office with the door shut. Okay, so I'm not saying it's great. But if you need that, it's all there. Okay. So antimicrobials. What do you need to know about this? I'm not going to ask you anything about that. Selective toxicity is an important concept because we want to give a drug that is going to be harmful to the microbes but not harmful to us. And so that's a key thing. And selective toxicity can occur in a couple of different ways. It could disrupt the bacterial cell wall, inhibit the enzyme unique to the bacteria, or disrupt protein synthesis. Okay, so those are the three ways. And um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about disruption of the bacterial cell wall with your um, penicillins and cephalosporins. Um, and then go through all the other, or the other two steps with different antibiotics as well. So we already talked about these classifications, so I'm not going to say it again. Microbial resistance is a big problem, and I, I think you probably hear it in all kinds of classes, but these are the four actions that cause microbial resistance. So a decreased concentration of, a, of the drug at the site of action, and so that could cut because we underdosed them and we didn't get to the MIC, or the MEC, rather. It could be that the patient stopped taking antibiotics before the treatment time was complete. And so you guys know if you have to take a drug for 14 days and you feel better after six, it's hard to keep up with those last eight days, right? Um, it could be due to inactivate, an, inactivating a drug. So one drug inactivates another, a drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Could be due to alterations of the structure of the target molecules. So mutations of the bacteria is what that would look like. Or it be, could be due to drug antagonist. So either the bacteria produces some kind of enzyme that um, antagonizes the drug, or you give a dr another drug and there's a drug to drug interaction. So here's how you decide how to give an antibiotic to a patient you figure out what the organism is. If you don't know what the organism is, and you, what do you do? What's that kind of therapy called? Empiric therapy. So you make an educated best guess based on where the patient's infected and what, which pathogens typically cause infection in that area. Right? So if I have a cough and fever and rails in my lungs and you think I have pneumonia, you'll treat me on, with a drug that normally treats bacteria that cause pneumonia. Right? Um, host factors are important when you're selecting antibiotics. So you, you don't want to give your, use your biggest gun for your smallest infection. And if you have a young, healthy patient, you don't need to use your biggest, strongest antibiotic. So your biggest, strongest antibiotic might be saved for those that are critically ill, for those that are severely immunocompromised, that you have to give them some extra attention or care to get rid of the bacteria. Sometimes you can't give the bacteria or the antibiotic you want because of drug allergy. So you, based on drug allergies, then you'll go to your reference point 
and find another antibiotic that kills that same bacteria that's safe for the patient. Fortunately, you don't have to make that actual decision, but you might be the person who notices that the patient has a cephalosporin allergy and they have rocephin ordered, which would be a very common drug, right? You have to do something about it. Um, you might not want to give a drug if it can't penetrate to the site of infection. So a simple example, neosporin ointment, right? If you have a, let's say you have a severe infection of your skin and tissue and it's gone all the way down to the bone, putting a little slab of ointment on top of that, is that going to penetrate? No. So that's a really simple example, but you want the drug to be able to get there. And then you want to look at your other patient variables, like your patient age, demographics, ethnicity, and all that kind of thing. So again, you're looking at the drug and you're saying, is it safe for my patient? That's one of the first things I always want you to think about. Um, I talked about prophylactics, and I said that would be using an antibiotic to prevent infection. Some of the specific times we give antibiotics or antimicrobials to prevent infection include patients going for surgery. A lot of times you'll see patients getting three doses of antibiotics, so one pre-op, one intraoperatively, and one postoperatively. And we're trying to prevent any infection from reaching um, inside the body. Commonly done, especially like with, um, say, joint replacement, if you're having a hip replacement or a knee replacement, this would be a common practice. Um, if patients are at risk for bacterial endocarditis, right, so they have, so you're at risk for that if you have like a mitral valve prolapse. If you have a mitral valve prolapse when you go to the dentist, the dentist will give you antibiotics before they do treatment to your teeth. Because if that gets in your bloodstream from your teeth getting worked on and it goes to the heart, you can start getting vegetation on the leaflets of your valves, which is bacterial endocarditis, who do prophylactics and then neutropenia, if you don't have enough white blood cells that fight infection. Yeah, so in this particular situation, it's telling you what? <laughs> I don't have the full key on what this means for this particular. I'm gonna guess that is correct, but I, that's only a guess because I don't have the key for this particular lab, sorry. That would be a, your patients take carbenicillin, da 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 da. Do you give the drug, hold the drug, whatever? And you, this is resistant, so you would say, I will hold the drug and call the doctor, right? So, not that difficult. I'm going to have to look it up and let you know. Okay, I think we already talked about dosage, size, and duration pretty much, right? So your antibiotic has to reach the site of infection and has to be there long enough to kill it. Um, shouldn't be discontinued prematurely. Teach your patients um, to complete a full prescription. And so when you're studying for any of these classes that I'm giving, or we're giving in pharmacology specifically, always think about the role of the nurse, the safety of the patient, and educating your patient. And everything we do should be kind of focused around those things. These are your steps to prevent infection in hospitalized adults. So we know that if patients contract an infection within the hospital, it's more likely to be a, mere, a more virulent strain of bacteria, more likely to be a gram-negative anaerobic bacteria. And we're also, we also know that these patients are more likely to be sick. They're already in the hospital. And so we've got to do some things to prevent illness. We'll do that by keeping the patients vaccinated against particularly flu and pneumonia. Every day, if you have a patient with a urinary catheter, you should be asking yourself, do they need this catheter or can it come out? And there's a medical need for a catheter versus a nice thing to have a catheter. It's nice to have a catheter when your patient's incontinent all over you know, the bed. And it's nice if your patient's very difficult to get up and move to the bathroom but it's not medically necessary, so it's a little bit of a fine line there. Um, target the pathogen. Use your antibiotics quickly or safely and wisely, and then prevent infection by doing good hand washing and using barriers. One note here about using antimicrobials wisely. 
It's treating um, infection and not contamination. So remember when I was talking about drawing blood cultures and you have to clean off the skin to make sure you don't get skin bacteria in your sample? Sometimes if you get a Staph aureus um, reading in your culture, you think you have a dirty skin sample. Make sure you're not noticing that that's contamination and not treating the patient for that. So it's not really your job to make the final decision, but it's your job to point it out to someone else to make the decision, okay? And you wanna treat infection and not colonization. So colonization is when you've been exposed to a bacteria and it might, you might have some within your system, but it, you're not ill versus an infection when you are ill. And so you might hear nurses and doctors say, oh, I'm probably colonized with MRSA. Well, yeah, we probably are because we deal with MRSA all the time. I probably have MRSA in my nares, but um, you don't need to treat me for it because I'm not showing signs of infection, okay? So don't treat colonization. Okay, so we will sometimes give antibiotics in different combinations, um, and it's important to think about what you're doing when you're doing it. Um, you want to do so in a way that causes a synergistic effect and not an antagonistic effect. And so some antibiotics used together will counteract each other. You'll know that because you've looked it up in the drug book before you gave it to your patient. Some drugs are synergistic used together. There's a drug called Bactrim. That, anybody had know what Bactrim is, used for urinary tract infections and skin infections and things like that. Um, it's got sulfonamide in it and another drug called trimethoprine. Together, they work better <coughs> to fight bacterial infection. So you wanna give um, synergistic um, antibiotics together. If you have a particularly bad infection, or you have a particularly virulent strain of bacteria. <coughs> How are you gonna know if your antibiotic treatment's working? What will your patient look like? Better? So they'll show less signs of infection, so maybe their temperature comes down, or if they had redness or swelling at a specific site, maybe that goes down. Maybe their pulse rate resumes, goes back to normal. Maybe you looked at their lab results and their white blood cells went back to normal, okay? So think about what you would do because whenever you give a medication, you always assess it for effect. And so for antibiotics, it's not like a pain medicine where you can go in in 30 minutes and see is your pain better. You'd have to assess it over time and keep looking back at your patient. Some drugs become toxic in the body and you need to draw drug levels. Vancomycin is a good example of a drug that has a specific toxic level. Vancomycin is a drug that we draw, we draw what's called peaks and troughs. So you draw a peak after you give the drug within an hour, and you get a trough with an hour before you give the drug. Okay, so if I had a peak and trough order, I'd be on call, phone with the lab and say, okay, at four o'clock, I'm supposed to give this drug to you come get the trough now, I give the drug, and then I'll say, okay, come back at what, in an hour and get the peak, and let's see what the patient is. We wanna make sure we're getting the MIC and the MEC correctly without getting toxicity for our patient. Is that it?